You've seen them drive down the street. You've probably been stopped while they changed the red lights while they passed you by. You've seen these large pieces of equipment drive by and wondered, what are they? What are they for? How much do they cost? And why is my tax dollars paying for it? I'm Dave Smith. I'm here with Chief Edeldauer to talk about what it's all about. Chief, what do Dave, we have here? This is a 2012 Smeal 100 foot aerial. It has a 2,000 gallon per minute pump. Uh, we purchased this for about 900,000. Uh, the new ones right now run about 1.1 million to 1.2 million. That's with no hose, no equipment on it, just for the truck. Uh, this is an aerial tower. So it has a basket on the end of it so the guys can stand in the basket and shoot water down to the fire. Now you're asking yourself, why do we have this in a community that doesn't have very many tall buildings except maybe the hospital? You also need this for homes to get up on the roof sometimes. You also need it for large, huge um, buildings like K or Kmart, okay. Walmart, things like that to get up on top of those buildings because when the fire spreads you need something to get up there and stop the fire. So that's why we have this vehicle. And probably spreading the, or hitting, spreading the water down is probably a better angle than to yes. put the fire out there. As long as our guys are not inside, okay. we can push it down. We don't want to get pushing it down if they're inside. So that's why there's a huge coordination on the side of a fire to determine where people are at any given time. Okay. Now, a million dollars for this, or one like this, what's your life expectancy on it? We hope to get 20 years out of it. Our last ladder lasted us 20 years. Uh, we are selling it now okay. because it's at the end of its life expectancy. Uh, this one, we hope to get 20 years out of it also, but as the maintenance cost goes up, then you have to decide whether you want to keep it, refurb it, or buy a new one. Uh, by the time this one is ready to be replaced, we're probably looking at 1.5 to 1.6 million dollars for a new one. So we are already putting money off to the side okay. uh, to save for that in the future so we don't have to have um, huge loans or a huge outlay of cash all at one time. We have worked it over the years. That's very smart thinking. It's good to see that the, the, the board is moving that far ahead, the fire department we, and the board. We usually try to work out our plans to about 10 to 15 years ahead for vehicle replacement. Okay, can we walk through this? Absolutely. All right, Chief, first things first. I see a lot of shiny gauges and buttons and valves and things. What is this? Well, on this particular unit, we do have a pump. Uh, so we can supply this with another engine. We also have some water on here, but this is a 2,000 gallon per minute pump. Wow. So we have our discharges. The larger ones are usually intakes. Okay. So we can hook this right up to another engine or hook it up to a hydrant and supply this uh, pump. And then we have the discharges, and there's not a whole lot of discharges on this one because we have the big main one going all the way up the ladder to the tower so they can squirt water out. I have operator, apparatus operator Lynch here who operates this piece of equipment and he has to know what every single gauge and valve is for. Wow, so you know all these, the dials, per se, what are, what are most of the gauges for? Um, all these smaller gauges here are for the individual discharges. Um, so like this one here, they're all color coded, red, blue, black, yellow. Um, so these will go to the house? This will go to the, the hose the fire. that goes to the fire, yes. Okay. Um, and then each one of these individual gauges is for each discharge here that are next to it. Um, and then we got uh, a master gauge up here that's going to be the overall pump pressure that it's putting out. And then this one over here is going to be our intake, which would um, show how much pressure we have coming off our hydrant. No, it comes right from the hydrant? Right from the hydrant. Okay. okay. The big yellow hose. Yep. Now, does it go into a storage container and then out? We do have 300 gallons of water that's stored on it, so okay. we can fill the tank off the hydrant and use that um, as an auxiliary tank before we are hooked up to the hydrant. Nice, and then you have hoses here and probably hoses all yep, over the place. hoses in the back also. But if you figure it can do 2,000 gallons per minute and it has a 300 gallon tank, that goes pretty fast. Yes, that goes very fast. Yes. Wow. You guys keep it in great shape. I mean, it's really, it's really pretty, but it's, it is technical. How long does it take you to learn something like this? Um, well, the FAE class to learn how to operate the pump is about 40 hours. Um, and it's, it's pretty uh, time consuming. It's, it's hard to learn all that. FAE stands for Fire Apparatus Engineer. Thank you, I was gonna ask that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're moving down. And there's a lot of these pretty doors. What's behind door number one? Valves? Okay. You got an electrical box? Yep, that's for the, uh, <laughs> that's the electrical box that runs uh, from the generator that runs all of our lights on the tower. So it's a regular breaker like a house? Regular breaker like a house, yep. That's interesting. Um, then we got an outlet here and also up in the basket for hooking up uh, fans or lights or tools okay. or whatever we have to. 
Um, various couplings? Yep, various couplings help us um, hook up hose if we need to use a different one to connect uh, two un, uh, uneven size hoses or something like that. Every uh, fire truck needs a fire extinguisher? Gotta have a fire extinguisher, yep. Um, this is also the compartment that most of the engineers keep their gear in. Okay. Um, just to store it out of the way so it's not in the back in the way for the guys. And okay. then that's pretty much about it. A couple uh, spanner wrenches here we call them for hooking up hoses. Oh, okay. Um, tightening the couplings. And that's pretty much it for that one. Next one. And they keep their gear in here because they could go on an EMS run and they may not need this. So they don't have it hanging out like oh. you see in some of the TV shows. Okay. We're sitting there waiting because they do dual duty. So they're also paramedics. Okay. So this one will also respond to EMS calls with the ambulance. Okay. So are all of our firemen paramedics? Or? Yes. We, all, we only have a couple that are not. And we push them all to become paramedics. And that's all we hire right now is paramedics. That's very nice. That's very, very forward thinking. And door number two? Door number two is going to have our saws in it. Whoa. Um, we got two different kinds of saws. We have a chainsaw, just like you might have at home. Um, that's well, it's a little beefier. A little than the beefier, one I, yep. Yeah. Um, they're built up a little bit more than a, a standard one you'd have at your house. But um, we use those for regular roofs on homes to cut through the, the wood and the shingles. Okay. And then we also have a rotary saw here that is, we got different blades we can put on it. Um, some are used for wood, some are used for metal, some are used for a combination. Um, but we usually use those on our larger box stores with flat roofs if we got to cut through uh, multiple layers of uh, tar and wood and stuff like that. And then that. metal decks. Metal decks, yep. Yeah, where a chainsaw wouldn't cut. Why do you cut holes in the roofs? Holes in the roofs. We cut holes in the roofs to let all the hot gases and smoke out of the building, all the bad stuff you don't want to be breathing. Also makes it a little bit easier for people to see, move around, you know, they're in the building. Okay. Okay, just because you always see them, the first thing happens is they kind of, on a fire, when you see it, they come in and they cut a hole in the roof. Yep. And that's and I'm also sure coordinated after at the scene because once you cut that hole in the roof and you open a door down below, you're in, injecting air into the fire okay. and the fire could take off and expand rapidly. So you have to work that all together with the crews that are around the outside of the building plus the crews on the roof. You don't want to be uh, working against each other. So we, we have to work it together. It's, a, it's an uh, overall attack. That's why we have a command person on the scene, and then we'll have an operations person that's running the fire, and then there's persons in each sector. It's, it's just like when you watch uh, um, TV war Yeah, it's just like a battle. They're coordinating. Yeah. That's what we're doing. We are actually coordinating our efforts to a, a concerted fight to get to the seat of the fire and put it out. Because many years ago, I was on a fire with you guys when we burnt a house down which was just unbelievable, fascinating. But now we're looking at the opposite way. We're trying to put it out. Now, all you, all the firemen wired? So they all have communications of Yes. We all wear radios inside. Okay. Yes. Now with inside, the full outside. gear on, can you still go through? Can you still hear with them? Yep. Yep. Excellent. And door number three? Door number three, we just have some hand tools. Um, axes. The, the infamous fireman's axe. Yep. yep. Um, a couple different kinds. We have ones with flat, uh, flat backs on. We have some with picks. Um, this is called a Halligan tool. It's used along with the flathead axe to um, force doors okay. or something like that. Um, mauls, bolt cutters. Just what you would need for to, to, to get into the houses to, right. to work on it. Yep. Cutting holes in roofs, we can use these axes. If the saws, something happens to the saws, there's always a manual way of doing it. And I'm sure from a, from a budget standpoint, one of these axes aren't the same cost as a $10 no, that Bulls is not axe. the same as an axe you get down at the hardware store. Uh, these are specially made for uh, firefighting use. Uh, you see they've wrapped them all, they're all their handles with tape, so they have a little bit better grip. Okay. Because once you get your gloves on and your gloves get yeah. wet, especially in the winter time when it gets wet and it may be freezing see, up yeah. a little bit, so they have them all wrapped so they have a little bit better grip on them. And they look like a much, much bigger and thicker of a head too than yeah, the standard one. I wouldn't Much. want to try to cut lumber down, or cut a tree down with that. I'm not really made for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one? Here we got some um, rope bags. Oh. With life safety rope that we use if we have to um, repel, go rescue someone that's down in a ditch or off a building or something okay. like that. Um, so we got three of those. And then we got some uh, helmets and gloves to wear while you're doing that because you don't want to wear fire gear normally while you're using rope. Um, and then we got a bunch of carabiners and pulleys and stuff if we got to make up systems or connect rope or something like that. That's one thing most people probably don't even think about. If you have someone in a car accident on I-80 uh, by, by 30 and they wind up down in that ditch on your side of the creek, you may have to go from 80 we could down have to make a haul system and pull them up. Yep. 
They yeah. they practice rappelling out of the basket and come going uh, down the rope. So it's um, they're they're practicing stuff every day, always working on things. I noticed too that you have little containers here to say air bottles. Yes, every little piece of space on this vehicle is used <laughs> for something. So in here we hide an extra bottle because otherwise it'd be a, a waste of space. Oh, okay. So we have an extra air bottle so they can uh, get in. These are not oxygen bottles, they're air bottles. So they'd be in the backpack of uh, of your, your respirator, what you go breathe and everything? Yes. Yours. So it's, it's like a scuba bottle? Yes. Yeah, you try to explain it to some people don't understand. They think it's oxygen where it's not. It's, it's not just oxygen, regular air. It's air. Yeah, same stuff you're breathing right now. Yep. Then you have your down your downriggers to support it. Yep, those will come out and then go down to support the uh, Oh, they come out too instead of just down? Out, yep. Okay. The next one. This is the engineer's air pack. Okay. Um, it's kept back here because we don't want it in our seat while we're trying to drive. All the other ones are in the seats. Um, so that's mine that I wear. And then down here we got some harnesses and stuff. Um, a lot of our gear has the harness built in the pants, so we don't have to put these on. But if you don't have that in your pants, these are the ones that they would put on to go up in the basket for okay. safety. Um, some road cones to help direct traffic if we're at an auto accident. Oh, yes. Um, to make people aware. And then just some uh, clips here. They can go on our gear to hook into the basket to keep us in there. Okay. Now with the, with the um, air packs, are they any special type of air bottle? that resistant to heat or something? I mean, it's got to get kind of warm in there. Yeah, it does. And then all, all this stuff is made to withstand some high heat. Unfortunately, the heat that we're working in is so high, uh, one of the first pieces that can fail on your whole complete outfit with your gear and your air pack is the face shield of the mask. Uh -huh. That will start uh, failing and start cracking when you get into about 700 degrees. Wow. Now, we typically can be in a house that's 800 to 1200 degrees, and they can get as high as 1800, but most, most of the house fires are about 800 to 1200. So if you're in there for a long period of time and the heat is rising, you could cause failure to your air pack. So we're very um, uh, cautious on how we get into a home, we work as a team, and we back out if things are going bad quickly. So we have to know what that is, but with, we're so encapsulated anymore with, uh, we have hoods that we wear over our heads, same kind that race car drivers wear. Okay. And so we don't feel the heat anymore. Back when I was a young firefighter, our ears would burn and blister, and we knew it was time to get out. Now, we don't do that anymore. We have complete coverage. But they do fail uh, if it gets very hot. Things will start burning. In fact, uh, two Kansas City fires that died recently it showed a picture of their uh, uh, helmet with their face shield and it was about this long it had just melted and drooped so right. they there's nothing that can handle the heat that can still be as maneuverable for us yet. And what I learned several years ago was that because of all the plastics we are now introducing into our house yes the temperature is rising in a house fire yes before when when, when we were younger it was just wood now right. it's all the plastics and plus the, the and the heavy timber would uh, burn for a long time before it failed. Now with the uh, fabricated joists, uh, the particle boards, uh, the uh, uh, fake I-beams that they're building now, those fail rather quickly. Okay. So we have to be very cautious inside the uh, buildings. Excellent. Okay, we're at the back of the truck and you're right, no space is wasted. You guys have rooms and buttons and knobs and switches and dials and storage and it goes quite a ways back there. That's very impressive. What are, first things, what are all these buttons for? Um, well, you're going to have identical buttons on the sides here. These are what control the outriggers that are going to stabilize the truck if we put the main up. Oh, okay. Um, so these will slide it out and put it down. Okay. And then down here is our control panel for our PTO, which is what runs the stabilizer system or the aerial system. Okay. So we can switch back and forth between that. And, and then you have a, a leveler to make sure that you're sitting? Yep, it gives you the level indicator to make sure the truck's sitting level so we can put the, uh, the ladder up. Now, do you need to sometimes put uh, pads or something underneath? We have ground pads on okay. each one that go underneath. Just because it. if you get an unstable ground? Yeah, it protects the ground and the, and the stabilizer. And then you have ladders? We got, yep, we got lots of ladders. You um, have one little thin one. That's called a Fresno ladder. That's, uh, it's an extension ladder that's just a little bit skinnier than a regular ladder, and it fits in attic spaces or anywhere that has tight, limited access. Okay. And uh, this, does this come out at all? That or whole hose bed will slide out the entire length of it. Um, it's probably about 10 feet long, and then it makes it easier. It, it actually slides out and drops down, 
and makes it easier to load the hose on. Oh, okay, okay. It, it, everything is, I can see in why they cost so much just because of the compartmentalizing, but million dollars and you don't get the hoses or anything. No. That's just the piece of equipment. No, and we have to have our hoses tested annually. Uh, usually uh, every year we have a few pieces that will fail, so we have to purchase new hoses okay. constantly. Do the hoses go bad in the middle or at the couplings? Both. All depends on what kind of use they had before. Okay. So these are uh, the big five inch hose and these will go right to the uh, fire hydrant or from like a pumper to this. So this uh, can supply you a, a lot of water. Do you get a couple years out of them, months? Oh, I've, I've, I've seen hoses that are uh, 10 years old. Okay. It all depends. It, it, if it's, uh, um, I was just down in Coal City for a large grass fire and they lost a lot of hose because the grass fire overran their hoses and burned them up. Okay. So they have to replace all those. Okay. Interesting. This is the uh, controls for the ladder. That's for the PTO, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. And you can see they even have a gauge here to see if they're level. Now, do they have a remote control too for the... Some, okay. Some do, but we do. So this is everything, so if you want to pick the ladder up, you have to come back here? Uh, up at the top there, actually. Okay. Or in the basket. Okay. Okay, so you can get into the basket and then operate it yep. from there. Excellent. Okay, we're on the opposite side, and the first thing we see is the infamous Jaws of Life. That's right. Um, these are actually battery-powered Jaws of Life, unlike the regular ones we have that are hydraulically powered by uh, hoses and uh, pumps. Um, this has to be a little easier on the fireman. Carrying it is. This thing it's around. a little more portable. Yep. Doesn't carry quite as much power as the bigger ones, but it still gets the job done. For your cars and stuff. Yep, a quick enough. door pop or something like that to get someone out real fast. It works really, really good. And more fire extinguishers? More fire extinguishers. Yep, we got three kinds. We got a, a water extinguisher there, which is just pressurized water, and then a CO2 for your electrical fires and stuff like that. You don't want to be putting water on, and then a dry chem. Okay. Okay. Yeah, people forget how you have to have three different types based on what kind of fire you're putting out. That is correct. Yes, the last thing you want to do on an oil fire or a grease fire at home is to throw water on it. Right. Yep. See, I remember that <laughs> from a long time ago. And more repelling gear? Water rescue gear. Oh, um, water rescue. In case some, someone's in the water, we got to get them out. Um, we also have some more in the cab, but we got water helmets there, life vests, uh, shoes, tagline for keeping people, keeping track of them in the water and stuff like that. Now, this isn't Florida, and most time when we have water issues, it's probably either fall, winter, or spring. How do you guys? Keep from hypothermia. We have uh, we have Mustang suits in there. It's actually a big, uh, almost like a Gumby suit that you okay. wear, and it it seals out all the water, keeps you warm, and pretty much it's waterproof. You can go in the water and not get wet at all. Okay, because you see that you see the guys and you see the rescues, but it's like okay, it's not warm water around here. This will this will do you in pretty quick. Right. And they do train in ice at least once a year. They cut a hole in the ice and put somebody in. We'll cut a hole in the ice and actually get in the water with the suits. Oof. Good luck with that. <laughs> More axes? Yep, more hand tools. Axes, halligans, we got a sledgehammer there. Um, this is a port of power, it's a little hydraulic spreader. Sorry about that, we had to take a brief intermission because we started to get rain on. And it was about 10 minute, maybe a 15 minute break. And let me say, in that time we had two calls. Two, two, ambulance, and, calls. two ambulance calls. So it's a very busy station here. And it's amazing how much work these gentlemen actually do. Now we're getting back, we, we did the hand tools, we're back to all the hoses and big fan. Well, what this is is a smoke ejector. Um, this will help us get the smoke out of the house. We can set it up. It runs off electricity, which can run off the generator on the truck. Okay. Um, so we got a uh, cord reel here. Supplies power to that. We got some lights down here. It's you know dark in there. A, a hanger here, which we can put between the door frame to hang the fan off the ground if it needs okay. to be up higher. And that's pretty much it for that one. No, and this I'll, is. How important is that? This is nice. It gets the we can we can run it either way. We like to blow the smoke out of the house. You can actually blow it into a window and blow the smoke through the house and out the other side. Okay. Uh, but it's actually for evacuating the smoke. So we can blow that, uh, put it in a window. We can put it in a doorway and blow the smoke out. It's important to get the smoke out so we can see what we're doing, especially when we get into the overhaul situation. Um, what we've uh, seen lately in firefighters is a huge rise in cancer. So we're trying to keep our air packs on for a longer amount of time. Okay. And there's a lot of toxins in the air. So if we can get a lot of that stuff out of that house so we can operate safer, that's, that's good for us and our overall health. Yeah, and if you look at what people have in their homes now, the amount of plastics and carcinogenics, I mean, it's, 
There's a lot of stuff you really don't want to breathe if it starts to melt or burn. Right. I mean, some simple things. Uh, wool, when it burns, produces cyanide gas. Okay. So, I didn't know that. Cool. It's just things we have to watch for. And the last compartment? Last compartment, we got a RIT bottle or RIT pack, which we use for saving one of our own if we had to, if they went down. It's a 60 minute bottle instead of the, the smaller ones that we carry on our, okay. our air packs. Um, a rope bag here for large area search. We can hook it outside the door if we're going in. Um, so we have a, a way of getting out. We know where we came from. And also searching off of it in large open spaces. And you have two empty containers. Those are normally where two air packs would go. Are we short two air packs? Yes, we are. Um, we actually could use replacement of all of our air packs. Um, we're not buying any right now because we're at looking at uh, seeing what we can buy in new air packs. Uh, but if we change them out, we may have to change all of them out. Um, right now, I'm looking at about $4,500 to $5,000 a piece. For the air packs? Yes. Wow. So it's not like scuba gear where you go out and spend a couple hundred dollars in your No, it is not. These are very expensive. Uh, they have a lot more uh, things on them today. They have buddy breathing where we can hook into the, our partner if he runs out of air so we can help him out of the uh, building. Um, so right now I'm looking to replace, if I replace all of them, it's going to be about two hundred and twenty dollars to $250,000. Wow. And that's something people don't realize. Just the, the, the everyday small, if you want to call it small, expensive that agencies have to deal with. Yes. Yes, and our, our air packs are okay right now, uh, but they are also getting to their end point of life, and we need to start looking at uh, replacing them. So we're looking at going to air packs that other municipalities around us are using, so they're interchangeable. Okay. You have air on this side. What's, what's that for? That air is supplied to the basket, so we can breathe out of that. Okay. Um, it's pre pre-plumbed all the way up so we can hook our masks up to that and breathe out of the basket instead okay, of it's, it's not a jet powered for it no <laughs> that way they can have air up there without having their air packs on so okay. they can stand up in the basket they put a mask on just plug into the air bottle we have one on each side and that can keep them up there safe for quite a long time also on the bottom of that basket is a sprinkler to keep the bottom of the basket cold or cooler so your boots don't melt to the basket okay if now, you're above a fire how high is this the, this go this is a 100-foot aerial. It's got a 100 right there. Okay. You'll see some departments will take the zero off, put a one up there just so it's one larger. <laughs> but it's actually a 100-foot aerial. Now, what kind of wind stability? I mean, how, how windy before you guys can't go up? If it's fully extended and you're all the way up there, it, it'll move around quite a bit on you. Okay. Um, but is there a, a wind speed that you'll say, no, we can't do it? No, uh, I haven't seen any yet. Uh, with these outriggers up, uh, you put it up there, the higher you go. When it starts shaking a lot, you're going to see them come down a little bit for a little bit more stability. Okay. But uh, when you use the water up there and you're shooting water from one direction to the other, back and forth, that also pushes that basket back and forth also. So you'll spray as you move? No, the basket will move when you're spraying. Okay. So you're spraying over here, pushes the basket one way, because there's some flex built into these. Okay. Just like a bridge. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an impressive piece of equipment. We are in the ba basket and we are looking at all the stuff before we go up in the air. What is all this for? All these are the controls that are going to run the basket from here. Um, there are similar controls down at the turntable down there. You can control it from the bottom. Um, this is a digital screen here that's going to show everything from the uh, rotation angle of the, the ladder to the height, um, ex how much it's extended. So right now we're extended 0% because it's bedded. Um, it'll tell you your breathing air pressure on those yellow bottles we showed you earlier and it'll also show you the system pressure for the hydraulic system, um, how much pressure is in there. We can control all of our, there's a day and night mode, we can control all of our lighting. Um, we got blue ladder lights that light up the, the, light at, or the ladder at night. Um, it's all controlled from here. We can do our check engine menu, it tells you your RPM, fuel level, it, it'll show you everything from here. And now it's a, it's a bit windy, we are safe, right? We'll be safe. Okay, so we well, got- Don't mind if I freak out because we're going quite a ways up there. So we got some more controls here. We got the deck gun on the front of it that's going to put out the water. Um, it's all it's all electronically controlled from these three switches right here. We can move it up, down, left, right, uh, make it a, a fog pattern like a garden hose or a straight stream. Now, how much water does that put out? That'll put out over a thousand gallons a minute. Okay. 
that, and then, like the chief said, that must make this move. Quite it'll a move bit. it quite a bit. That's a lot of force coming out of it. Yeah. Especially when you're all the way extended with some wind. Yeah. And then of course your regular controls here for up, down, left, right, and out. Now what happens if we're all the way up? and something goes wrong, is there a fail safe down below that they could lower you? There are, there's emergency switches down there that you can override the system if something happened. Um, it usually takes two people to do, and depending on what goes wrong, it takes it could take quite a while to get it down, so. Okay, well, let's go. Okay. So that's our high idle switch, it'll make it move a little bit quicker there. Okay. It actually goes up very smooth. Yeah, it is pretty smooth. Yeah, you mm -hmm. figured it'd be a little more jerky, but it's not. I mean, actually, if you didn't know you were moving, if you didn't look around and see everything standing out, you wouldn't really notice you're moving. It's a very comfortable platform. Now that made you jump. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll extend out a little bit. So this is showing you your ladder angle here. Okay. So we're just about 30, 30 degrees there from from the truck and then 65% extended so we can extend it further if we need to. And that's showing your, your rotation left and right so we, we didn't move anyway that way. It is an amazing how stable it is. Mm -hmm. It's very stable. I, I, do, I would not think it'd be this stable. And it's a pretty windy up here right now. Yes, it's very windy up here right now. Kind of gives you a different view of the town. It does, it gives you a really good view of the town. <laughs> you can see almost everything. And are people still all golfing? How high up with Silver Cross Hospital will this go? Um, it won't quite make the roof. At some points it will. Okay. Um, but yeah, it'll get close. Now, going back to movies, TV stuff, would you actually go along the building to take people out of the building? From a window? Yeah. If we had to, yes. Okay. Yep, we could, could go off that, the roof. It would be stable enough to hold up against? Yep. Interesting. It's a nice, I can see why it costs a million bucks. <laughs> this is a heck of a piece of equipment. It sure is. We got done looking at a uh, ladder truck. Now we're at an engine. Yes. Now what's mainly the difference besides this one looks a heck of a lot older? Well, this is an engine or pumper commonly known as, and um, this one is 1997. Wow. Um, this is um, an old pumper. Uh, it's still running pretty good. Uh, it needs to be replaced. Uh, we are not going to replace this maybe for another couple of years yet. So it's probably gonna be 20 years by the time we replace this. Now this one I see has Papa Schaefer's name on it. Yes, it does. It's uh, honor of Papa Schaefer. Everybody knows him. Uh, when we get the new one, we'll probably put something on the back of the new one, and that may be in a couple of years. So. Okay. In 1997, I mean, that's pushing your 20 years? Well, a pumper, I actually should get rid of a pumper in about 12 to 15 years. Okay. Uh, this is a, probably a little bit beyond. Uh, the one good thing about this is this was built before all the computers and stuff came out, so there's a lot less electrical wiring running back and forth through this one. Um, and as most of you know, the good old days when all your cars were just cars yes. and they didn't have computers in them. Uh, so a lot of the guys still like running this because it's it's purely manual. There's no computers running anything on this. But unfortunately, like at home, how many of us drive 1997 cars? Uh, we don't. Um, but this one, is, we kept it up very well. It's starting to show a little age now, but it's uh, in relatively good condition. Uh, for being almost 20 years old. Uh, you can see a little corrosion here and there, but it's doing very well. Uh, we do carry um, hose on this. Uh, this has a thousand gallons of water on okay. it uh, for when we go to fires, especially in the rural areas that don't have hydrants. Uh, this is a 1,500 gallon per minute pump. The truck was 2,000. Yes. This is 1,500 gallon per minute pump. We have a thousand gallons on it, so you can see how fast the water can go. Okay, so, and now all the interesting things on this one mainly is in the back with all the life-saving equipment? We have uh, uh, our brand new extrication tools on this vehicle. Uh, we just got uh, those in the last two months, $28,000 for a full set. Um, our other sets are um, not in real good shape and we're starting to replace those now. So this is our first set we replaced. So we're gonna try doing another set maybe next year. Ooh, let's go back and look at them. Okay. I'm back in the back now with Greg DeVries, a firefighter EMT, and we're going to talk about all this stuff. What is it? This is our extrication equipment. Um, this is what we use, say somebody gets in a car accident. This is what we'd use if we can't get them out their door or something. Okay. We can basically cut the car apart to get to the patient. 
But it looks like that's more of a cutter. Yes, this is our cutters. Um, and then these are our spreaders. And then this is a ram. And this extends out to uh, basically ex expand the doorway or okay. whatever you need it to so expand. That'd be, that, that would actually cut the, the yes. top off it. Yes, you can actually go up to and take the windows out and actually put this around the post of the car where the windows go up and down and cut through it. How much do you know the sheer force of that, how much it'll cut? I am not sure on the sheer force uh, it cuts, but uh, yeah, I mean. It'll cut anything. Cut, cut a solid beam, yes. Wow. Of, of the and vehicle. then this just opens? This is a spreader. Um, so like say you got a, a place in the door where it comes together. Yeah. You can make what we call a purchase point and you can stick that in there and then the, those will spread open and actually spread that open and actually can pop the door open off the hinge. Really? Mm -hmm. And then this is if the, the door's squished in. Yes. It'll open it up. Yes, you can push it, uh, open it up, set it in there, and uh, and it, it will push open and it'll move all the metal and push it open. And everything's driven by that. Yes, a hydraulic pump. Everything's hydraulic. Um, so these these tails that come off the end. Yeah. These actually hook into here. Oh, okay. And, and just fit they, together. They just screw in and fit together, and then this tool would be ready to go. Now how far of a reach do you have with the hose? We have about 25 foot. We have two hoses, so you got 50 foot. But this is all portable, um, so we can take the pump off here and we can take it over to any vehicle we want to, or you can oh. carry it out into the field or any distance you need to. So if you wind up with a car out in the middle of a field and you don't take the truck there, you could just pick this up pick and it carry up this and take it out. Two mm -hmm. people? This is kind of heavy. Um, usually one person can handle that. Two people might get it there a little quicker, but uh, usually one person handle that and carry one guy carry hoses and stuff like that. Okay, and what's this? This is a strut. Um, this is what we use to stabilize vehicles. Uh, say we have a vehicle on its side. This would, uh, we can raise and lower it, and then this would actually go in the top, and then we'd take this, and so it'd lean in, and we'd take this end and hook it into a point on the vehicle low. Okay. And it would basically draw this end so it's tight against the vehicle to keep it from tipping. Okay. We have we have two of these larger ones and we have two smaller ones. And ideally you could get four, one on each corner of the vehicle and you can uh, keep it from tipping. So if, if it's on its side, you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about working on someone and having the car fall on. Correct, or it's on its top. There's multiple uses for them. So. Okay, yeah, because I'm sure if you start moving around and cutting and removing uh -huh. parts, it gets even worse. Yes, yeah, that's the first thing we wanna do is when we're cutting a vehicle or we're doing anything with a vehicle, we have to stabilize it. So we have wheel chocks, we have uh, a ton of um, what we call cribbing, it's wood. Um, you, just, you can stabilize the vehicle, let the air out of the tires so it sits on the cribbing um, to keep it from moving. So you don't have to worry about the vehicle getting away from you while you're cutting on it. Now do you have some kind of thing to put down so if there's gasoline spills or anything? We do have some um, matting and we call it plugging and diking, stuff okay. like that. Some, some hazmat materials that we have to uh, stop from them spreading or keeping them in place. Because if you have a car on its side, it's going to be leaking. Yes, yes. Yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, pillows and stuff like that that go down and they would absorb that or keep it from going in drains okay. and stuff like that. Keep it where it's at. Excellent, excellent. Any idea on how long this will normally last for you guys or? The stuff we have we have currently it needs to be replaced. Um, this is our newest set. Uh, we basically have to keep it in service until we have enough money to buy new. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. All the stuff in the back of the truck, if you look at it with between the, the, the ladder truck and this, it's amazing for a civilian. The amount of stuff you carry, the amount of space you have, but every little piece is utilized and the amount of work you guys do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. you guys do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.